We're brewing potions and telling fortunes. That's right, it's Quacks of Quedlinburg from Schmitchbiel. Schmitchbiel. Co-published by North Star Games. This bag building brew fest pits two to four charlatans and quacks against each other in a competition to see who can mix the most potent potables. At the end of nine rounds, the player with the most victory points from brewing powerful potions is crowned as the biggest quack in Quedlinburg. Sounds painful, but it's actually a good thing. Setup begins with the scoring track, placed center. Place the flame token on the first space of the turn indicator. Next, shuffle the fortune teller cards and create a deck in front of the player who last cooked something. They're the start player for the first round. Next, lay out the orange and black books. These are used in every game. Flip the black book to the appropriate side based on the number of players in the game, either two player or three or four players. There are five other sets of books, two books of each color and two sides on each book. For your first game, use the books with the single bookmark in the bottom left. You can mix and match other sets in future games, but let's start off slow, people. Set the green, blue, and red books near the orange and black. Set the yellow and purple aside for now. Set the ingredient chips near the book of their color. There's generally three levels of chips in various colors, one, two, and four. More on books shortly. Next, give each player a player board, which contains their pot, a bag, a droplet tile placed on the zero space of the pot, a flask placed on the large trivet next to the pot, and a rat stone placed in the small trivet next to the flask. Additionally, for each player, place a score marker on top of their matching seal tile atop their seal space on the bottom left of the score track. Finally, we made a little song for your starting chips. It goes like this. Finally, give each player four white one chips, two white two chips. No, don't use this. Four white one chips. Four white one chips two white two chips, one white three chip, one green one chip, and one orange one chip. All of these immediately go in your personal bag. Gameplay occurs over nine rounds split into three phases. Fortune phase, potion phase, and evaluation phase. Can you guess which one's my favorite? First up in the fortune phase. The current start player draws and reads the top card of the fortune teller deck. That's why you call it the fortune phase. You get it now? Now cards with a purple background have an immediate effect and cards with a blue background have an effect during the turn. You're just gonna do the thing on the card. Next, in the potion phase, players will prepare their potions simultaneously. Pulling chips from their bag one at a time, players will place them in their pot until they either wish to stop or their potion explodes. When a player draws a chip, they place it on a space after the droplet according to its value. A one chip goes one space ahead, a two chip goes two spaces, and so on. For each chip thereafter, the player places it that many spaces ahead of the previously laid chip. After each chip is drawn and placed, the player decides if they wish to stop or draw another chip from the bag. If they keep drawing, they risk a potion explosion, because if the sum of all the white chips drawn exceeds seven, there's too many cherry bombs in the potion and the pot explodes. An exploded pot means the player must stop drawing chips and they'll have less scoring options in the evaluation phase. Additionally, some colored chips have bonus actions that can occur based on the books selected during setup. The actions of the black, green, and purple chips occur during the evaluation phase, providing bonus chips, bonus points, and even allowing players to move their droplet forward for future rounds. Players continue drawing chips until all players have stopped or exploded. One option players have during the potion phase is to use their flask. Flipping the flask to its used side allows a player who just drew a white chip to put that chip back in their bag. They can still continue drawing as normal. 
This ability cannot be used if the white ship drawn would explode the player's potion. Once everyone has stopped or exploded, the potion phase ends. Next, in the evaluation phase, players follow the guide on the scoring track to resolve the potions and score points. The next space on the board after each player's last placed chip is their scoring space. Scoring spaces have up to three different attributes. The lower left number is victory points. The top number is the space's coin value, and some spaces also have a ruby bonus. These are all used in the evaluation phase. First, the player who reached the farthest space on the pot and did not explode may roll a bonus die. If players tie for this bonus, they all get to roll the die. The rolled results provide benefits such as immediate victory points, droplet movement one space, an instant ruby from the supply, or an orange chip added to the player's bag. Next, the black, green, and purple bonus actions resolve based on the books in the current game. All players whose scoring space has a ruby icon receive one ruby from the supply. The next two steps, victory points and buying chips, may both be taken by players whose pot did not explode. Players who did explode may choose only one of these options in the evaluation phase. When scoring victory points, move the score tracker along the score track. If a score marker exceeds the 50 points base, flip that player's seal and keep going. That's why it's there, silly. When buying chips, players may buy one or two chips in a buy phase and no more. But if they do buy two, they may not be of the same color. According to each book, Chips of different values and colors have various coin values. The players take the one or two chips they could afford this round and add them to their bag, along with putting everything in their pot back into the bag. Finally, players may spend as many rubies as they wish. To increase their future pot values, a player may spend two rubies to move their droplet one space forward. They may also spend two rubies to refresh their flask making it available for future use. A few notes about the rounds. Beginning in the second round, the rats enter the game. This clever catch-up mechanic allows players who have less points than the lead player to start their potions a little bit further up the pot. At the end of the fortune phase, for each rat tail between a player's score tracker and the leaders on the scoring track may place their rat stone that number of spaces ahead of their droplet. In that round, they place drawn chips starting from the rat stone rather than the droplet. Additionally, in the second round, the yellow book and its chips enter the game and are allowed for purchase. In the third round, the same applies to the purple book and its chips. In the sixth round, each player adds one white one chip to their bag. Rounds continue with players brewing potions, scoring points, and buying chips. At the end of the evaluation phase, players remove their rat stone back to the trivet, and the fortune teller cards pass clockwise to the next player, who is the new start player. Move the flame icon to the next space on the turn indicator and begin the next fortune phase. At the end of the ninth round, players may spin their coins during the buying phase to purchase victory points at a rate of five to one. They may also exchange rubies, two rubies per victory point. The player with the most victory points wins the game. Tiebreaker. The player who most filled their pot in the last round wins in a tie. If there's still a tie, then they're all considered equal quacks. And that's Quacks of Quedlinburg. I'm Becca Scott, and this is Good Time Society. If you had a good time, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and share this video. And if you really, really like us and you want to support more videos like this one, you can go to our Patreon page. There's a link in the description below. See you next time.